Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Trent Post. I'm an elder here at IEC. And uh, for those of you who know or maybe don't know, uh, our pastor Steve was on a well-deserved and needed rest last week with his wife and children. Um, and so we are thankful in God's timing and through the, say, arrangement of the Holy Spirit, um, our guest speaker that's here today uh, is going to be in Ethiopia for a month with his wife and children. And so we just love how the Holy Spirit leads and guides in his timing. Uh, we did not want our brother, Pastor Steve, just have to come right back and have to preach, uh, continue to rest, even though he just got here at 530 this morning. And uh, <laughs> but that's our shepherd, right? He wants to be with his flock and his people. So we love you, brother. Uh, so a little bit about our guest speaker. Uh, a fun fact first, let's say uh, Jed Medifin uh, at one point worked for the U.S. government in the White House as a special assistant to the president. We won't hold that against you, Jed, uh, working for the U.S. government. Uh, that was a time when I think it was George W. Bush, right? So the U.S. government at that time had a little bit of common sense and logical thinking still within it. So we won't hold it against you. That was a good time. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, Jed is uh, currently the president of CAFO which is the Christian Alliance for Orphans in the States. Um, it, it, the Orphan Sunday that we celebrate and recognize here, actually just doing ours last Sunday, is something that comes out of CAFO. The sixth annual uh, Debo Alliance for Children Orphan Summit that just happened here in this church this week uh, was birthed, the vision was captured out of some Ethiopians who went to these orphan summits in the States and God really spoke into their hearts to let's bring this to Ethiopia, like a movement, a collaboration of orphan care. And that is CAFO's goal is to bring uh, believers, the church, faith-based organizations together for the cause of the orphan and vulnerable children all over the world. And so we are thankful that he is here today to share with his, us his experiences. So Jed, if you'll come on up. Uh, we know that as we pour ourselves out for the kingdom of God, whether it be orphans or other areas of life, we get weary and we need to be filled up. So we look forward to being encouraged and blessed and filled up by the word the Holy Spirit has given you today. God bless you. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, it, is, it is a joy. My heart is glad, is full of gladness to be with you. I'm here with three of my five children right here in the front. Can you wave, guys? <laughs> and, uh, and we are spending a month here in, in your beautiful country. One of our daughters came to us through adoption from Ethiopia. So this, this country is deep within our hearts as a family. And, you know, every branch of the church, every expression of the body of Christ in all the different countries of the world, I think, has unique gifts unique gifts to give one another. And, and so being just this first week for us has been full of good gifts pouring in. I pray that the Lord will have some good gifts for you this morning. And so if you will rise, we will read from God's word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to start with a confession. This is a story from a number of years ago, the, the era that Trent mentioned when I was serving in the White House, working very long hours, early mornings, late nights. Many of the, the, the more healthy habits that I had kept in my life had kind of gone out the window. And there was one particular night I, I didn't arrive home until one or two in the morning, 
totally exhausted, and I crept through the dark house and lay down next to my wife, but my mind was so keyed up that I could hardly fall asleep. Finally, I fell asleep. It felt like a moment later my eyes opened. It was 5.30 in the morning, and I couldn't fall back asleep, so I got up, and I, and I crept quietly down the stairs because I had two little girls who were asleep there. And I, I got a cup of coffee, and I sat there in the darkness, just holding it, beginning to drink it. And, and finally, I felt some sense of calm and rest there in the darkness, just holding my warm cup of coffee. And then I heard a noise. It was, it was a creaking on the stairs. It was because my daughter, Sienna, who was four years old, she had heard me walk past her room. She'd woken up, and here she was coming down the stairs towards me and then across the shadowy room. And of course, there's very few things in the world that are cuter than a four-year-old in a onesie with her thumb in her mouth walking to her daddy. And you know what I wish I had said was, oh, sweetie, come to daddy. But the words that came out of my mouth very quietly, but she couldn't hear them, but this is what I said. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I just felt such a sense of desperation for time alone and for rest and for quiet that I could hardly stand to be with my own precious daughter. And the great irony of that is that at this time, my work was to serve and to work on behalf of and to direct big programs that were serving vulnerable children around the world. And yet there I was, and the, the little girl that I loved as much as any in the whole world, I couldn't even desire to have her sit on my lap. What was wrong with me at that moment? Well, let's turn to a story from the Gospels to unpack this a little bit further. This is a story that's familiar to you, I'm sure. Jesus has been on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. He's, he's, he's been there, and then he's returned with his disciples. And as he arrives, as his boat pulls up, a huge crowd has heard he's coming. They've already gathered. And as he's coming on shore, you can, you can imagine the people pressing around him. And there's sweat, and there's body odor, and there's just people all pressing. They all want a piece of Jesus. They all want to touch him. One of the Gospels says they almost crushed him. And in the middle of all of that, a wealthy man, an influential man, breaks through. He elbows his way through the crowd, and he says, Jesus, will you come with me? My daughter is dying. So much urgency, so many demands, so much press upon him. I think that's how our lives sometimes feel. But of course, Jesus agrees. He says, yes. And so he sets off with the crowd. And, and the whole crowd is going with him. They're like an, an avalanche, like a wave going over the hillsides, moving towards this urgent need and in the middle of all of that, Jesus stops. And you, you probably know what he said. He said, who touched me? Who touched me? And, and I'm sure some of the people kind of laughed. They said, Jesus, everyone's touching you. But he said, no, I know someone touched me because power went out from me. That word power dynamis. We get the word dynamite in English from it, and it, it, it means strength. It means life itself, the force of our life. It means health, power. That was literally pouring out of Jesus into someone. And Jesus waits there until a single woman falls in front of him out of the crowd. And, and we've got to remember, there's an urgent situation that everyone is thinking, Jesus, there's a little girl dying, 
but he's there present with this woman. And she begins to tell him this the story how, how she had had a bleeding disease and how doctors had taken all her money but not healed her. And the gospel say that she told him the whole story. And it was only after this that Jesus said, daughter, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. Now let's go back for a moment to, to that, that thing that Jesus said about power has gone out from me. Dynamis has gone out from me. Life and health and strength had gone out from her, from him, into her and brought her health. And I, I believe that that is the heart, that is the essence of all true ministry. In all true ministry, life and health and strength that God has put in us pours out of us into another person and by God's grace brings them new health and life and strength. It is a beautiful thing to be a part of that. And you, could, you can imagine lots of different ways in which that happens. I mean, think of a nursing mother. Literally, her strength, her life is flowing out of her into a baby and bringing life and health and strength to that child. But it comes in many other forms too. If you're running an organization and you care deeply about it and you're pouring yourself into it and God is using that ministry to bring good to others, that, is, that same thing is happening. Life and health and strength is pouring from you into others. And if you're a caring mentor, maybe you're working with a child who had been on the streets and you're, you're helping him or her to start a new life and you love them and you pray for them and you spend time with them, in that life and health and strength, they're pouring out of you into this child and by God's grace, he can bring new life in them. Or maybe you're a business owner and you care deeply for your employees. You're not just getting labor out of them, but you really care for them and you serve them, and if they're sick, you care, and you support them, and you, you're involved in their lives. Some of your strength is pouring into them. That is God's good intent. And guys, this is, this is life at its best, to be a part of this pouring out. This is the life that God calls us to. It's mirroring the, the, the character of our Father. He is the one who is always pouring out. And the opposite of this kind of life is no life at all. Some of you have, made, have heard of the Dead Sea in Israel. The Dead Sea is dead because water is always flowing into it, but never flowing out. And so all the water comes in, but then as it evaporates, all of the salt and minerals stay in the water and the water just evaporates and no water is flowing out and so it becomes more and more salty as the years go by. It is 10 times as salty as the ocean so nothing can live in it. That is what a life that is not lived in pouring out looks like. That's what it tastes like, it is bitter. It is no life at all. But we also need to know this. If we are living a life of pouring out and pouring out and life is not pouring into us in the same way, we will run dry. It's like a law of spiritual physics. If we are pouring out and life is not pouring in, we will run dry. And I think that is what was happening with me that morning with my daughter. And I imagine many of you have felt that at times in your own lives too. Maybe you're feeling that right now. That feeling of the dry soul. And sometimes you feel it in a physical weariness and exhaustion. And sometimes you feel it in just an irritation towards others, maybe towards your own family, maybe towards the people that you are seeking to serve. While you say you're serving them, you feel only irritation at them. And maybe you feel like you've lost your joy in your work or, and you feel no creativity. 
these are all marks of the dry soul. And I'll tell you, at many points over the years, both in my prior work in government and in ministry, I have tasted those things. And really, there is a triple tragedy, three tragic things that happen when we are in that place. First of all, we may not persevere. We may not be able to continue in the work that God has called us to do. But second, even if we do persevere, we may do so without the joy, without the pleasure that God intends for us to take in the work that he has given us. And third, if we continue in this work and yet have the dry soul, we will almost certainly fail to give those in our lives the one thing they most need. Because no matter what our form of ministry, what others need most from us is never just a program. It is never just a particular product that we may provide to them. Those things can be valuable. Certainly, there are times to provide a good program, to provide a meaningful product, medicine or food or education. These things can be very valuable. But the thing that others most need is to encounter a presence, a presence that reflects the character and presence of Jesus Christ. That is what all of us most need, to encounter the presence of Jesus Christ in one another. And we, we saw a glimpse of what that presence looks like in the story of that bleeding woman. You know, Jesus was in the midst of all of that urgency, and there was a, a girl, a little girl who was dying. There was urgency, there was noise, there was activity. And yet, in the middle of that, he gave all of his focused attention to that one woman who everyone else would have been happy to forget. He didn't just heal her physically. That was what she had come for. She came to be healed physically. But he knew that she needed more than that. And so he listened to her whole story. He gave his whole self, his eyes, his ears, his heart to that one woman. It was only after that that then he said, daughter, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. That is a little glimpse of what the presence of Jesus looks like. That's the kind of presence that others most need from us more than anything else we can provide. But when our soul is dry, when we are not receiving life from him, then we cannot do that. Those are the three tragedies of the dry soul. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. Our father, the good shepherd, delights to restore our soul. That is his heart. That is his true character. God is love. That's what John says. And the essence of love is to spill out good into others. That's why we do it at all. We love because he first loved us. Our pouring out is simply a reflection of him. It all starts there. That is who he is. He delights to pour life into us. And he is always doing this. He is always pouring out and in countless different ways. I mean, just, just pause for a moment right now. Think about your breathing. You may not have thought about it all morning, but every single breath is drawing life into you in a way that God ordained that air is a gift from God to sustain you and to pour life into you and me. Just feel that. Thank you, Father, for that gift. And he sends his rain, and he sends his sunshine. Like, like Jesus said, he sends it even on the righteous and the unrighteous, the evil and the good. He is pouring out always. 
And you know, one of the ways he does this is in the glory of his creation. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Romans 1 says that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been made. What that means is that when we go out into to nature, whether that's up on top of Mount Entoto or just in the park or just kneeling down and looking at a living plant, we are encountering a little bit of God's self-revealing through what he has made. And do you think that a human being is left unchanged when that happens? No way. Let me show you some pictures with my children when we've gone out into nature. That's one of my favorite things to do. And that's my dad with me when I was 10 years old. We always take a 10-year-old pack trip. It's a family tradition. When a child turns 10, they go with dad back into the mountains. And this is in Yosemite National Park. That's Marin there when she was 10 years old. And this next picture is also Marin. And that's Eden, our daughter. That's Lincoln, my son right there. And the next picture, that's Phoebe, who's sitting right there. And she, she loved catching fish. She didn't like to clean them, but she had to learn how to do that. But then we ate them up, and that was great. When we are out in creation like that, again, maybe in some amazing place, but, but maybe just looking at a single flower, God's goodness is spilling into us. And, you know, there are, um, there, are, there are hundreds of scientific studies now that show that when we encounter nature and spend time in creation, actually life and health and strength pour into us just by seeing it. So I'll just, I'll just mention one study. It, they actually looked at the records of people who had had surgery for cancer in a hospital over 10 years. And half of the patients had sat in a room whose window looked out on a brick wall. And the other half had been in a room whose window looked out on trees. And they looked at these records and they found that the patients who had looked out on trees, in their records, the nurses recorded fewer problems, fewer complaints, and greater cheerfulness with those patients. Now that's interesting. The patients who could see the beauty of nature were more cheerful, were more happy after their surgery. That's interesting, but it gets more interesting. They actually required less pain medication. They took less pain medication for some reason because they were looking out on the beauty of God's creation and, and it was coming in through the window. And then finally, that, that group also spent less time in the hospital. They went home earlier. It was like their body healed faster simply because the beauty of God's creation was coming in through the window. Wow. And there's many other studies that show that just a little time in nature can affect our bodies, can bring our stress level down, decrease blood pressure. It affects our emotions. We're less likely to have anxiety and depression. It affects our creativity, our intellect. We're actually come up with more ideas. It also affects our relationships with others. Actually, a person, after they've spent time in nature, is, are more generous with others. Amazing. And you know what I say? I, I, I say that the cherubim in Isaiah's vision were right when they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is always pouring out life and health and strength. It's, it's there for anyone, anyone who has their hands open to receive, even those who don't know him. In some mysterious way, that's his heart to pour out. So these gifts are there all the time. But I also believe that our Father invites his children into regular habits of receiving, just like a, a loving parent might invite their child 
to regular meal times, to receive on a, on a regular basis. If maybe you could imagine there's, there's a very loving and generous man, and as he walks down the street, there's children who need food, and he'll gladly give any of them food. But when he comes home with his children, he has them sit at a table, and it's meal time. Just like it said in the Psalms, he prepares a table before us, and he, he feeds us. And he invites us into to regular rhythms, regular patterns of receiving life from him. So that in addition to this, this receiving we can do anytime, anywhere, there, there is a consistency to receiving his gifts. Somewhat like sleep. But ideally we sleep each night and that refreshes us with a regular rhythm. And so I would like to share with you three rhythms that I see in scripture and in the practices of God's people throughout history. And, and I do want to say this first. This is not, what I am suggesting here is not a legalistic thing that, that you have to do to be a good Christian, okay? Please do not feel that way. This is, this is about thinking about our Father and recognizing that he delights and desires to pour into us, to refresh our soul. And these are some of the ways that we can do this. So, so as we head into these three rhythms of receiving, a daily rhythm, a weekly rhythm, and a yearly rhythm, I, I do first want to say what these, I, these rhythms of receiving are not, okay? Because so often we can hear about things like this and we think, oh, I, I have to do these things to please God. That's, that's not it. Okay, so these are rhythms of receiving are not, first of all, they are not things to add to do your to-do list. Secondly, rhythms of receiving are not performance to please God, to earn his favor. We already have that in Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, he says over you, you are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We do not try to earn his favor by anything we do. And third, rhythms of receiving are not about self-care. Self-care. I saw this advertisement on, uh, you know, it just was a pop-up ad on the internet, and it said, prioritize self-care with luxurious loungewear. I mean, doesn't that woman look so happy to you? Self-care is about us caring for ourselves. And there might be a time for that, right? If your face is dry, you can put some lotion on. That's self-care. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But what we are talking about this morning is God's care. His delight to care for his children. That is what we are talking about with this idea of rhythms of receiving. And so our now let's turn to what rhythms of receiving are. First of all, I would like us to think of them like the keys to a vacation home, okay? So my, my college roommate, one of my best friends, Mike, he is, he's been very successful in business. But instead of just taking care of himself, what he decided to do was he and his family moved to El Salvador and they built some beach homes for missionaries to use at no cost. That is his, and, and they do other things too. They do marriage counseling and others, but they, they have felt called to care for the missionaries of El Salvador. And so they built these beach homes. And so when a new missionary or another person in Christian service arrives in El Salvador, he'll say to them, I have a beach home that I would like for you to use. Now, he's not mad when they don't, right? But they're missing out. They're missing out if they don't receive that gift. So that's the first way to think of rhythms of receiving. Now, second, we can think of rhythms of receiving. We can move a couple slides forward there. 
is it's about connection. It's about time with our Father because the ultimate food to the soul is being connected to our Heavenly Father. There are other good gifts he has. His good gifts include physical food and water and air and beauty and exercise and time with loving friends. These are all ways he cares for his children. But most of all, it is in fellowship with him. And then third and finally, rhythms of receiving are about formation. That any time that we do something repeatedly, it forms us. Modern neuroscience actually show that the pathways of the brain literally take shape and are formed by things that we do repeatedly. And so these rhythms are receiving, God uses them to form the people that he desires us to become. So that's just a little backdrop. So let's, let's now talk for a few moments about the three that I'm just suggesting. This is, again, not exhaustive, but just through three ideas for you. And maybe what I might encourage is you to consider one of them and say, hmm, maybe one of these is a way that God might invite me in the year ahead to receive from him. So jumping forward to the first daily rhythm of receiving, and this is very simple. Very, very simple, and it's something I'm sure many of you do already, but it's simply to spend time alone with our Father each day. And that will look different in different seasons of life. Sometimes it might be a long period of time, maybe an hour or more. Maybe if you have small children, you're lucky if you can get five minutes by yourself. But that you seek to spend time alone with your Father each day. And, you know, you know, sometimes, especially in the evangelical tradition, we can, we can think, oh, oh, I know what that is. That's daily devotion. And sometimes, you know, you, you might even feel like, I need to do this. God won't bless me if I don't do this. I don't think that's the way that our Father invites us to see it. He's, no, he's saying, I have gifts that I want to pour into you. And so come away with me and open your hands to receive. Our Lord did this. The Gospels say that Jesus often went away to lonely places for time with his Father. And he invites us into that same rhythm. To each day, to open our hands, our heart. And I will, I will note that often technology can get in the way of that. Our phones. And so for me, part of my rhythm of receiving each day is actually to turn my phone off half an hour before bed so that my final thoughts of the day are not dictated by someone from outside, but instead can be slowing down, being present with my wife, going to sleep. And then when I wake up, I do not turn the phone on or look at it until after I have spent time with my father. That makes a big difference. Why would we want our first thoughts of today to be what, what other people have decided they want us to think about or feel? So that is a daily rhythm of receiving. A weekly rhythm of receiving. This also might be very familiar to us. Sabbath. Sabbath. Now, often when we think of Sabbath, we may think of some very legalistic thing where church people say, well, you can't do anything fun on this day. But that's, that is not what Jesus said about Sabbath. In his day, people misused the Sabbath as well. But he did not say, don't practice it. He said, remember that this was made for you. Sabbath was made for man. Just like those beach homes I was telling you about, my friend Mike made those beach homes for the missionaries to be refreshed in. God made the Sabbath for that. And he invites us into it for, for three main things, I believe. For rest, for worship, and for play. He invites us into Sabbath like children. And really all that is required of us is to take 
our long list of all the things we need to do. And we feel those things very heavily. And we take that list and we put it on the altar. And we say, Father, for this day, I will rest as if all of these things were done. I will get a little foretaste of heaven, what the book of Hebrews calls his Sabbath rest. We get a little foretaste of that on one day when we take all our productivity and all our to-dos and all our urgency and we put it on the altar and instead we enter into rest and worship and play. That's a second idea for a rhythm of receiving. And then third, the idea of a yearly rhythm of receiving. In the Old Testament, God God invited his people three times each year to lock up their houses, to leave their business and leave their fields and spend a whole week traveling up to Jerusalem with friends and neighbors for a time where they had no work and no worries and could enter into singing and good food and fellowship with one another and worship of God. And you could imagine them as as they walked together toward Jerusalem, they would come through the Valley of Baca, then they would begin to ascend toward Jerusalem and they would break into songs, the Psalms of Ascent that they had sung since they were children. And in Jerusalem, they would spend their days, there would be public readings of scripture, there would be worship, and in the evenings, those who didn't have relatives with homes in the city, they would camp around the city, and and you could just imagine them around a fire like that. And actually, the Torah called them to use their money and buy their very favorite foods and drinks. That's what God told them to use their money for in this time. And so they, whatever your favorite food is, that's what you were supposed to have. And you would, you would eat and sing and celebrate together. And of course, today we might call that, oh, that's a vacation. I've had vacations before. But there, there is something a little different about saying, you know, I need to take care of myself, so I'm going to plan a vacation for me. There's something different from that in saying, you know what, my heavenly father is calling me to have a time each year where I step completely away from work and I enter fully into this time of celebration and rest and joy and my favorite foods. I mean, when you think about it that way, do do you maybe see God a little differently? That he's not that distant boss or the cold father who's always saying, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. It's very different. You start to feel differently about your father when you know that these types of things are his heart for his children, and that he delights, he rejoices to pour life and health and strength into us through things like this. So again, I I don't want you in any way to feel like, oh, we are... We're under the law. We have to do these three things to be a Christian. No. But we are invited into them. And maybe, maybe this afternoon as you're thinking about these things or having lunch and talking with a friend or with your spouse, maybe you'll talk about, is there one of those that our Father is inviting us to open our hands and to receive on a regular basis in a rhythm of receiving. And when we do this, what I have experienced personally, it is the opposite of those three tragedies that we talked about earlier. Because as we live lives of pouring out, and that is indeed, that is the best life to live lives of pouring out. For me, that is in work related to orphans and vulnerable children. And for you, it may be other things. It may be here in this church. It may be your, your business. It may be your family. It may be children on the streets around you. Many different things. You are, I trust, living lives of pouring out. Life and health and strength are pouring out of you day by day. But when we are receiving life from God like this, we can persevere. We can continue in the work, even when it is very hard at times. 
And we cannot just persevere. We can continue with joy, with the pleasure in the work. There may be times when we feel exhausted or frustrated, but, but we can still find a deep, godly joy in the work. And finally, as we receive life like this, we can offer to others the one thing they most need to encounter the presence of Jesus Christ in us. The presence that looks like Jesus when he was with that woman who had the bleeding disease. Amidst all the urgency, giving his entire heart and his eyes, his thoughts, his attention to her, delighting in her, calling her daughter. And only after that time was done, then he went on to the next thing, to deal with the next urgent need. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing to be a part of God's pouring out and then our doing likewise, pouring out. A life of pouring and receiving. Let's pray. Our Father, our Good Shepherd, You delight to restore and refresh our souls. Teach us what that reveals about you. Help us to know you and your true heart more deeply through these things. And help us also to enter and to receive them more fully. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.